it's uh, great to have everybody here. Uh, this is whatever, the 65th year of virtual living. I have no idea about time anymore. <laughs> I'm really glad that everybody could, could join today. And um, seriously, we've been online with Kukua Mau Meeting since uh, March and always looking for new opportunities to keep our community talking. And as we know, the skill set that you folks here bring to the current situation is needed more now than ever. So as a group, I think it's fabulous that we can continue to support each other, hear what's going on. And so I'm so glad to see people today. We have a fabulous opportunity today that we have uh, for the first time uh, done a mapping project on what palliative care is available where in Hawaii. And this project came about because our speaker today, Chelsea Hirano, was looking for a project as she was a graduate student at UH in nursing. And uh, she works nights at Queens and she was looking for something that was different. And thank goodness we found Chelsea because it's just been a real pleasure to work with her. So what we're gonna do today is Chelsea has done this project to get, we've done this together over the last uh, six months and she's gonna present the results of her data. So again, I'm really happy to see everybody here. It's great, um, we can't be in person, but at least we can be uh, via Zoom. I'm going to introduce, introduce Chelsea. I wish I could give you a lay, uh, but I cannot. But um, I am really grateful for all the fabulous work that you have done. So. Chelsea was born and raised here on Oahu. She works now as a nurse at Queens on a med surge unit. I learned today for the first time that this was not her first degree. She, already, she also has a bachelor's in human development from UH, but then she went back to school and got a second bachelor's in nursing and she's getting her master's in advanced population health. So Chelsea, I'm so glad you're doing this and take it away. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining. Um, like Jeanette said, I am a grad student at UH trying to get my master's in advanced population health nursing. So um, for my capstone project, I had the opportunity to work with Jeanette and Hope and Kokua Mao, and it was good to learn all of the stuff about palliative care, advanced care planning. Um, and this has been a really exciting long project <laughs> not long it's been six months but <laughs> with all the changes of covid and everything it's definitely added in some curveballs um, but let me share my screen and we'll get into the presentation okay so today we'll be talking about our um, study that we did on mapping palliative care in hawaii um, like jeanette said there hasn't been any mapping studies done for our state before. So this is just a baseline, um, many bumps in the road, but uh, we're excited to share our results with you guys. So just an overview of today, I'll be going over defining palliative care and its importance. Um, we'll go over our project, how we conducted it, as well as our results, the gap in opportunities for improvement and the recommendations that we received from our respondents. And then finally, I'll go over the supplemental care programs that are available in our community. So to start, what is palliative care? As many of you may know, it's specialized medical care for those with serious illness. So for example, cancer, um, heart failure, end stage organ failure, dementia, and chronic, a lot of chronic illnesses. Palliative care can help to provide pain and symptom management. Um, it also relieves the stress of the illness for both the patient and the family. So it can provide them with support, whether it's emotional, um, social, practical support. And it also helps them um, get resources or like DMEs. Palliative care is usually provided by an interdisciplinary team of specialists, and they work with the patient's other doctors to develop and enhance their plan of care. So it's important to distinguish palliative care versus hospice. Um, I know sometimes some people will use the two terms interchangeably or will get them kind of confused. 
So hospice is an approach to end of life care that is employed when it's no longer possible to cure a serious illness or if a patient chooses to stop curative treatments. It provides comfort care um, to a patient with a terminal illness whose doctor believes he or she has six months or less to live. On the other hand, palliative care um, is available to patients at any stage of a serious illness and is actually best provided at the time of diagnosis. And what's good about palliative care is that it can be provided in conjunction with curative treatment. Okay, so this slide is CAPSI's definition of palliative care. CAPSI is the Center to Advance Palliative Care. And we use their definition um, to guide our study. Like I said before, it is specialized medical care for those with serious illness. It helps to provide quality of life um, or improve quality of life for the patient and the family. Um, it involves multiple specialists um, and it can be provided at any point of the serious illness. So as we all know, palliative care is super important. Um, not only does it help the patient and the family, um, it gives them support but it has also been shown to improve resource utilization and lower healthcare costs for patients as well as hospitals. Um, by ensuring that resources are matched appropriately to patient and family needs and priorities, they can be utilized in a more effective manner. In addition to this, we've also really realized the value of palliative care during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it can help to manage symptoms. And another thing is that a lot of hospitals have restrictions on their visitor policies now. So um, palliative care can really help to provide that extra support to patients, maybe when their families can't always be there. This slide shows um, the value of palliative care. This comes from CAPC as well. And it just shows how it can reduce um, admissions and cost. So for example, in the Inpatient setting, inpatient palliative care can help to reduce hospital readmissions by 48% and can reduce the cost by 28%, and that's per day. Um, outpatient palliative care helps to prevent hospital admissions as well as emergency room visits. And palliative care in skilled nursing facilities can reduce hospital and emergency room transfers. And home-based palliative care reduce total cost by 36%. So the reason we did this project, Kokua Mal um, really realized the value of palliative care and um, realized that there's, there really isn't a set definition for palliative care in Hawaii. There's also no mapping studies that have been done um, and no collective information on our palliative care in the community. Uh, we mostly did this project to see what was out there, what was accessible, um, and we wanted to learn more and discover opportunities to improve it. So the objective of our study was to map palliative care in Hawaii, identify its availability and accessibility, as well as identify the gaps and opportunities for improvement. We looked at all settings of palliative care, inpatient, outpatient, and community-based. So as you can see, inpatient, there were seven programs that participated in our survey. Um, two programs in outpatient and nine programs in community-based setting. What we did was we created and sent surveys to um, hospitals, clinics, and organizations across the state of Hawaii that were known to have some type of palliative care program. And from that, we were able to collect the data that they reported. Um, we found that in general, the number of consults from 2018 to 2019 increased. However, despite that increase, a lot of our survey participants reported that they feel like they're not seeing everyone that they should be seeing as far as palliative care goes. So the first setting we're going to look at is the inpatient palliative care setting. One of the few studies that have been done on the gaps in palliative care was conducted by the California Healthcare Foundation in 2014 and 2017. So this study really served as a guide for our report. According to the California study, they defined inpatient palliative care as care that is delivered to seriously ill hospitalized patients, usually by an interdisciplinary team, typically but not always composed of a physician, nurse, social worker, and chaplain, and they help to provide consultation to other hospital staff. 
of our inpatient setting, there were seven programs that participated. Unfortunately, Kaiser was unable to participate, but they do have an inpatient program as well. Out of the seven programs, five of them reported that their program corresponds with the California Studies definition of inpatient palliative care. The remaining two programs, one of them said that their program doesn't align exactly with that set definition, but they do offer palliative care services. The other organization described their program as a consult service. Next is the breakdown of the way in which palliative care is delivered. So five of the programs um, said they operate primarily on a consultation model and the other two primarily use the co-management model. When comparing the total number of consults from 2018 to 2019, 100% of the respondents reported an increase over that span of one year. So as you can see in 2018, the total number of inpatient palliative care consults was 1,814. And then in 2019, it increased about 20% to 2,189 consults. Something super important to note was that despite this increase, um, they still all said that they feel like they're not seeing everyone that they should be seeing. The top three locations where referrals are initiated, um, this is for adult inpatient population. It was the ICU, cardiac telemetry unit, and med surge unit in that order. The next slide, I have the graph of it. So this is the graph of where consults are typically initiated. Like I said, it, the ICU was the top, the most common, followed by cardiac telemetry and then med surge. Um, other locations are emergency department and oncology unit. So this is, like I said before, this is for the adult population. This excludes Kapiolani since um, their pediatric population differed from their adult counterparts. And we'll discuss that further in another slide. So we asked programs to list their top five diagnoses of their palliative care patients. And we found that the top three were cancer, cardiovascular disease, and chronic lower respiratory disease. And we have the reported percentages up here too. And we have the other common diagnoses, advanced kidney disease, end-stage organ failure, medically complex and frail, neurologic, um, cerebrovascular disease, advanced liver disease, and trauma. Of course, with each diagnosis, um, it presents its own challenge and often requires an interdisciplinary team of specialists to help devise and implement the patient's plan of care. We were interested to see um, what the different facilities had as far as their palliative care teams. So we asked what types of disciplines and how many of each are involved in your team. Um, as you can see, Queens has the biggest um, team comprised of three physicians, two APRNs, two social workers, and one chaplain. But it was nice to see that most of the programs were equipped with some kind of nurse, either an APRN or RN, as well as a social worker. In addition to the listed diagnoses, there are several referral criteria or triggers um, that inpatient palliative care programs use in order to identify appropriate patients. So we asked them to list their referral criteria and triggers, and as you can see, it's pretty different across the board. Um, while some require a physician order, others use triggers such as the need for pain management, um, if the patient had multiple hospital admissions in the past, or by patient or family request. Some facilities said they didn't have any spe or specific criteria. And then Kapiolani's, as you can see, is more tailored towards pediatrics. The outcomes of Hawaii's inpatient palliative care programs were also surveyed. So in order to assess response time and efficiency, we asked the programs to estimate the number of consults that were received within three days of admission. I'll leave this here for you to look at for a little bit, but this is for the year 2019. And moving on to the next slide, we also looked at discharge disposition of the inpatient um, population. So we asked them to estimate percentages of their patients that were transferred to community-based palliative care, to hospice, and then we looked at inpatient mortality as well. So this first graph looks at the percentage transferred to community-based palliative care. This is for 2019. Hawaii Pacific Health reported that they don't collect this data, so we have Queens and Castle here. This graph 
shows the percentage of inpatient palliative care patients who transitioned to hospice in the year 2019. And finally, we have the percentage of inpatient mortality for 2019. As far as pediatrics goes, we have Kapiolani. Um, they have a pretty unique palliative care population, um, and it's the only pediatric program of its kind. So their patients typically have different illnesses or conditions compared to the adult palliative care patients. Their top five diagnoses were cancer, prematurity, congenital anomalies, severe HIE, and anoxic brain injury. So with that, their top locations for referrals um, were the NICU, PICU, and oncology unit. Kapiolani reported that their palliative care is automatically initiated for certain conditions. So for example, low birth rate, pre uh, severe prematurity, bone marrow transplant, and anomalies with poor prognosis for recovery. To summarize what we learned about the inpatient palliative care population, we learned that most programs are consistent with the definition of inpatient palliative care as defined by the California study. So we have their definition listed here again. We also learned that most programs were equipped with either an APRN or RN and a social worker. And all of the programs in this setting reported an increase in number of consults from 2018 to 2019. We noticed that there was a variety of referral rec uh, mechanisms and triggers, as well as discrepancies in discharge disposition across all of the facilities. But the most important thing that we learned was that all of the respondents felt as if they're not seeing everyone that they should be seeing. So clearly the need um, for palliative care is there. As far as outpatient palliative care, we surveyed Queens and Straub. Um, we did receive news a couple days ago that Kapiolani sees some outpatients as well, uh, but we were unable to collect the same survey data. So for Queens, uh, they have a supportive oncology program embedded in their cancer center. It's a team of palliative medicine specialists. Um, they have three physicians, and four APRNs, each with individual panels. The staffing consists of three half-day clinics per week, and they also have appointments available as needed. Those are available five days a week, and that's for things such as urgent visits, oncology visits, or um, getting help with coordinating chemotherapy and radiation. The patients must have the criteria of active cancer and must be receiving oncology services from a Queens-based office. Their referral sources come from the medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and surgeons. An interesting thing was they actually noted that their outpatient palliative care referrals don't typically come from primary care providers, but instead they come from these specialists. Um, the top three reasons for referrals are pain management, determining goals of care, and advanced care planning and support for the patient and family. So looking at Straub, they provide geriatric and palliative care consults, um, as well as palliative consults for medical aid in dying. It consists of one physician and one APRN who receive referrals from primary care providers, oncologists, and neurologists. The top reasons for referrals involve end-of-life discussions, advanced care planning, and dementia accompanied with behavioral change. Straub noted that they accept all patients without the need for specific criteria. This graph shows the total number of consults in 2018 versus 2019 among the two outpatient clinics that we surveyed. So there was an increase in this setting as well. When asked to estimate the number of days from referral to the initial visit, Queens reported an average of 11 days. Straub noted that they don't have definitive data available, but they acknowledge that there is typically a wait time of at least one month. And when we asked to report on their outcomes, um, Queens revealed that they use the Palliative Care Quality Network, the PCQN metrics, to track symptom burden, referrals to hospice, and so forth. 
Straub expressed the positive outcome of their patients, transitioning with their individual goals of care supported and peacefully passing on with the guidance of their family. This is a quick slide on Kapiolani. They were able to provide us with um, their total number of outpatient consults in 2019. So as you can see, they had a total of 30 consults and it's broken down as follows. So there's the PEDS, gynecologic and breast oncology, as well as perinatal. So to summarize outpatient palliative care, while it's great that these programs exist, um, we recognize that they are all different and that's in the way that they operate or track outcomes. We also noted that um, Queens reported their re referral sources rarely come from primary care providers. So it might be an indication that there is an opportunity to increase palliative care awareness for primary care providers in the future. Currently, palliative care programs don't have standardized measures to gauge their outcomes. Um, so moving forward, it would be good to implement standard measures and metrics across all facilities. The last setting we surveyed was um, community-based palliative care. So nine programs participated in our survey and they were located across Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and the Big Island. All of them said that they participate in at least one or a combination of supportive care, which is from HMSA, um, concurrent care from UHA, or the VA in-home palliative care program. Uh, most of them, all but one, said that they are already a registered Medicare Part B provider. And they all expressed the need for other health plans to offer palliative care coverage. As you can see, number of consults in community-based palliative care generally increased from 2018 to 2019 as well. In 2018, there was a total of 521 consults across all facilities. And then in 2019, um, they had 613 new consults. So after gathering the data from all the settings of palliative care, um, we were interested in looking at the gap and opportunities for improvement. So using the California study as a guide, we focused on the need for palliative care among those in the last year of life. Um, we are aware that palliative care should be initiated ideally at the time of diagnosis, but um, the California study did it this way and we thought it would be a good place to start. So um, what the California study had done was they looked at the sufficiency of palliative care by comparing the number of patients served to the need for palliative care. They had provided a low estimate of need and a high estimate of need. Um, and I have Hawaii's data here. I will explain in the next slide more in depth on how we got those numbers. According to the CDC, in 2017, the total number of deaths in Hawaii statewide was 11,505. And from that, we got our low estimate of need of 7,145 people. And our high estimate of need was 10,416. So what we did was we took the average of that, which came out to 8,781. So we could say that about 8,781 people need palliative care per year in Hawaii. From here, we also just rounded up to 10,000 to make a nice even number when we calculated our actual numbers of sufficiency. So to explain further on how we calculated our low and high estimates of need, um, the California study had listed seven medical conditions that commonly need palliative care. So that's Alzheimer's, cancer, stroke, um, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, chronic lower respiratory disease, coronary heart disease, and diabetes. So in Hawaii, according to the CDC, the total number of deaths in 2017 due to those seven specified conditions was 7,145. So that's our low estimate. Um, the high estimate of need was calculated by taking the total number of deaths in the state, which was the 11,505, and then we subtracted the number of deaths that were due to accidents, suicides, or homicides. So from that, we got our high estimate of 10,416. Like I said, in order to make things simpler, we rounded up and used the approximation that about 10,000 people need palliative care per year in Hawaii. Um, so from that, we were able to calculate the sufficiency across all settings. So inpatient palliative care had a total of 2,189 consults in 2019. Um, so we were able to calculate that 
their sufficiency was about 21.9%. In outpatient setting, there were 472 consults in 2019. Um, so their sufficiency was calculated to 4.7%. And in the community-based palliative care setting, they had a total of 613 consults. So using that and estimating that 10,000 people need palliative care, per year, uh, they have a sufficiency of 6.1%. This graph shows the sufficiency of palliative care in Hawaii comparing 2018 versus 2019 um, across all settings. So from our surveys, it was clear that many palliative care programs were aware of the presence of a gap. Um, and according to the survey, it was noteworthy that 100% of inpatient palliative care respondents felt that they are not seeing everyone that they should be seeing in their setting. When we asked them to estimate the gap of patients that they're not seeing that would be appropriate, inpatient um, programs responded with values anywhere from 4 to 50% more cases than they are currently seeing. There also appears to be a gap in community-based palliative care as well. Most of the community-based programs stated they could increase capacity to see more um, palliative care patients in their setting. So some elements that they listed that are needed in order to increase current capacity were things such as more referrals. That was pretty much across the board. Everyone was saying they needed more referrals. Uh, but they also said they needed more participating insurance plans to help cover costs increased staffing and the funding to do so, and community awareness and education. The respondents felt that barriers to providing more palliative care were things like lack of insurance benefit coverage for meaningful services, um, fragmented and insufficient payment or reimbursement, and knowledge deficit among the community as well as healthcare providers. So we had surveyed the programs across all the settings on ways to enable earlier and wider access to palliative care. What we did was we took the recommendations and organized it into CAPC's domains for improving palliative care. So CAPC has these domains of specialty workforce, payment, quality and standards, clinical skill building, and public and provider awareness. And um, those efforts all help to improve palliative care. Under the specialty workforce domain, um, inpa inpatient palliative care expressed the need for more outpatient clinics in order to move things upstream and improve continuity of care. Another recommendation was to increase support and staffing to allow for earlier involvement at the time of recognition of severe illness. Outpatient palliative care um, expressed the need for increased diversity in interdisciplinary care and additional team members. Another proposition supported greater interdisciplinary training in primary palliative care skills. And lastly, respondents expressed the need for expansion of pediatric hospice and community-based palliative care services in Oahu as well as on neighbor islands. Under the payment domain, outpatient palliative care suggested wider coverage for supportive and concurrent care as well as stronger payer and provider relationships. Similar to the suggestions made by outpatient programs, community-based programs propose to increase supportive care services and benefits to widen the end-stage diagnosis codes. Another suggestion was to aim to remove the time limit on supportive care benefits. And then respondents also advocated for expanded access through other health plans available throughout Hawaii. The third CAPSI domain to improve palliative care is quality and standards. So currently, palliative care programs do not have standardized measures to gauge outcomes. However, moving forward, um, it would be good to implement standardized measures and metrics across all facilities. Programs also reported that they would like to see a movement to initiate palliative care at the time of diagnosis for all age groups. Under clinical skill building, outpatient palliative care referral sources rarely come from PCPs. Um, so it might be an indication that there's an opportunity to increase palliative care education for primary care providers. 
Another suggestion was to increase opportunities for locally based LNET courses for physicians and nurses. And finally, the last CAPC domain to improve palliative care is public and provider awareness. So the most frequently reoccurring suggestion was to increase publicity, education, and awareness of palliative care to both the community and healthcare providers. Um, one way we can do this is to share positive impacts of palliative care in order to help facilitate awareness and the benefits of it. The programs also recommended better education and resources to help everyone understand the scope and benefits of palliative care programs. And the last suggestion was to um, increase marketing to community physicians to inform them of supportive care options. In addition to palliative care programs, there are supplemental services that are also available to Hawaii's community. Um, many of these programs are offered by hospice organizations. However, they're not exclusive to hospice patients. So these programs pretty much exist as a result of an unmet need in the community of how people are cared for. Um, a lot of hospice organizations acknowledged this gap and took the stand to create and um, implement these supplemental care programs to provide an extra layer of support. So I'll just briefly go through the list, but um, Koko Amao is working on providing a list as well of all of the options available. So Bristol Hospice has two programs. They have the Bright Moments, which is tailored towards dementia, um, and the AIM program, which is in-home primary or palliative care services that helps with physical therapy, occupational therapy, as well as um, coordinating supplies. Hawaii Care Choices in Hilo has Kupu Care and Kupu Palliative Care. Um, so Kupu Care, it's mostly con um, consultative in character. There's no hands-on care, but it does help with education and symptom and case management, as well as providing that extra layer of support. Their Kupu Palliative Care utilizes the concurrent and supportive care benefits from HMSA and UHA. Islands Hospice has their Islands Transitional Care Program, which is a free non-billable program. And it's really great because it helps to um, transition patients from the hospital back into the community. So many of the um, often patients will be going back home, but they need extra supplies or assistance. So this program helps with medication reconciliation, helps them apply for resources, um, and it helps to coordinate with other community providers as well. Kauai Hospice has their palliative medicine partners. Um, it helps with symptom management and providing the support for the patient and the family. Navion Hawaii, they have the integrated care program, um, which are palliative care services that are not time limited. It provides disease education and monitoring, um, assistance with community resource referrals, and similar to others to it provides that extra layer of support for the patient and um, family. Last, we have St. Francis Hospice. They have their Care Plus program. It's a care coordination program that provides education and referrals and assists with paperwork. They also wanted to include that they do offer other services like adult daycare, assistance with meals um, and transportation and so forth. We have our references. And Jeanette, if you have anything to add. Well, thank you very much, Chelsea. That was really fabulous. Thank you. Uh, clearly, there's just so much work that's been done and um, you know, clapping, if we could clap in a room, we would be doing that. I think that was really um, incredible. You know, I do, as we were doing this, Chelsea and I worked on this since January. Fortunately, we met once in person before the, melt, the, the lockdown, the meltdown, the lockdown started so that we, um, we did meet each other once, but otherwise we've been um, having Zoom meetings um, all the time to keep on top of this and get the surveys out and back and all of that. So I do want to thank everybody who completed the surveys. And, you know, this is, this is a, a starting point. And we certainly see how complicated it is to do something seemingly simple, like figure out how much palliative care there is. But once you really start 
with figuring out the definition of palliative care and, and uh, how are we going to define that and all, it becomes much more complicated. So, um, and, and again, I think Chelsea, first of all, started by saying, you know, there's not really a clear definition of what palliative care is. So that's where we are as a field of defining, of defining palliative care. 